Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good to be here again at the Heartland Institute. With some jealousy, we are witnessing what is happening here in the United States. And uh, I think that uh, the effort of the Heartland Institute is really tremendous, very sophisticated, very professional. And I must admit that we do not have any counterpart in the Netherlands as far as Heartland is concerned. Uh, however, uh, we have been pretty successful uh, also in the Netherlands and uh, I would even say uniquely successful over the last few weeks. I will come back to that later. Now I would like to address climate change, political, economic and social implications. I'm an economist and in the Anglo-Saxon world I'm always surprised that economists are not regarded to be scientists. I have been uh, told when I was a young student that Adam Smith was the one who turned all kinds of loose bits and pieces of economic thinking into something which became an independent science. Scientific method has been applied in economics, so I always thought that I was a scientist, but nevertheless I'm not, at least not regarded in the Anglo-Saxon world and especially not in the world of climate science. Economists are interested in climate. Why? Personally, I became interested because I thought that the implications of climate policy would be very serious, very serious indeed, even devastating as far as their impact on our economic system is concerned. And uh, I try to understand a little bit better what the climate science, the underlying, underlying climate science was. <clears throat> and then, of course, there was many years ago the third assessment report, TAR, of the IPCC. And there was the summary of policymakers. Being a former policymaker myself, I was also depu deputy head of the planning staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. So being a former policymaker myself, I thought this document has been written for me. And I read it, 16, 17 or 18 pages. And I counted the words uncertain, uncertainty and equivalence of that. And I counted 40 of those words. And since I had also to write those kind of documents myself, because I have also been a political speechwriter, I thought, well, this is a very good job. Uh, and my reaction would have been, well, thank you, scientists. You did a tremendous good job. Uh, still, there is some uncertainty. Please go on. But that was not the reaction, the official reaction to this report. The official reaction was to start climate policy, to start Kyoto. Now, <clears throat> Uh, as an economist, uh, I must, of course, be short and simple. I would like to apply this principle to what I'm going to say. And uh, I will mainly focus on the political, social, and economic aspects. But there are, of course, also uh, more scientific aspects. And uh, those aspects have been dealt with in this booklet, which I wrote with two co-authors. It is called Man-Made Global Warming, Unraveling a Dogma. And uh, it has been published a couple of years ago. And uh, many th things which are still topical today are already included in the booklet, including, uh, for instance, the solar hypothesis by Henrik Svensmark and uh, other uh, alternative ideas. Uh, when writing the booklet, we have also addressed uh, the underlying scientific uh, elements. And one of the things which I think is very uh, appealing that is this uh, graph. This graph is uh, something which fits well within the climate propaganda and shows very clearly that there is a close correlation between the CO2, CO2 rise, which is the green curve, and temperatures, which is the red curve. Uh, and you see the, the mean, the average uh, temperature rise uh, as a black curve. Now. This is clear, and this is the message, uh, shorthand message, 
which uh, is a major part of the IPCC propaganda. But this is the wider image. And there you see that there is no correlation whatsoever between CO2 concentration, the green curve, and uh, the various uh, rises and declines of temperature. And you can take any period you want, millions of years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, there is no correlation whatsoever between temperature and CO2 except for 1975 to 1998. So this is an indication that there is, well, actually, to my mind, that there's not much wrong with this, uh, this uh, so-called man-made global warming and that it is a non-existent problem. Uh, here you see uh, a detailed graph which shows for the uh, last uh, 12 uh, years or 10 years, uh, same image, CO2 is increasing and temperatures are going down. No correlation, no correlation whatsoever. Uh, this is a Moncton uh, graph. Uh, Christopher Moncton has showed it several times, and there you see, on the one hand, the increases in temperature as projected by the IPCC, and you see the actual temperatures. The uh, temperature projections by the IPCC are going up. It's a wide range. They are going up. In fact, temperatures are going down. And as far as CO2 is concerned, the projections of CO2 concentration are going up, and then you see the actual CO2, which is the blue curve, that is uh, actually be below the range of various CO2 increase scenarios. Now, as an economist, of course, I uh, cannot pass judgment on the uh, underlying science, but I can share with you my impression of what is going on in the underlying science, and this is my impression. I think that uh, some more study is needed. And of course, for the global warmers, this is good news. If you want to have uh, your subsidies, then of course, there must again be a new reason to prolong your programs. But now, uh, I would like to focus on the economic uh, aspects. Now, it is often said, and I'm very uh, sorry to confess that the organizations where I worked as a deputy permanent representative for the Netherlands, the OECD, was actually the source of this idea. Namely, we should apply market principles on CO2, CO2 trading, in order to get the best results for the money. And they always said CO2 emission trading is in conformity with market principles, but is it? To my mind, it is not, because it requires a prior act of creating and distributing property rights to emit where no rights existed before, and only governments can do so. So the role of governments is very important. Now, in Europe, we have this European trading system, emission trading system in Europe. These national emission ceilings are the outcome of negotiations on a European level between the EU members, countries, and other countries which will join this scheme. Well, you know, a couple of East European countries and also uh, Japan uh, are part of the scheme. And then after that, the individual countries are freer to distribute the emission rights nationally according to the schemes of their liking. So first there is an international effort, an international agreement, and then basically it is on a national authority. But uh, what is happening now? Will the, U will the US and other countries join this European mini Kyoto, which is in existence? Well, to my mind, this is not the case. Under the old administration, the US has repeatedly declared that it refused to join. But Obama gave first the impression that the United States would join the scheme, but he made a proviso. He said, well, no, the United States will not be part of an international ETS architecture. And that is a very fundamental point. It's what uh, many countries want the United States to do, but the United States refused to do. Of course, he, 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 did, he, he, he said it in passing. He did not 
really put emphasis on it. And then, of course, there are other countries, majority of the population in the world, China, India, and the G70, 70 countries, who have made clear that they will not accept any commitment to reduce emissions as from 2012, when the Kyoto Mark I expires. But the proponents of Kyoto, they always maintain that Mark I, Kyoto Mark I, the first phase of Kyoto, is only a tiny first step to achieve a substantial reduction of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. And they always say that many more follow-up steps will have to be taken, and the number of follow-up steps is estimated to be something to the tune of 10 to 30 additional steps. Now, two scenarios are conceivable. One is a Europe's Alleingang. That is a German word. It means a solo effort. And the second scenario is a worldwide Kyoto participation. Just to stir your fantasy. It's all very hypothetical, but it will clear up the problems which we will face if we are going down that road. Scenario one, Europe's Alleingang. Europe will continue on its own with its midget son of Kyoto. Well, the costs, of course, will be staggering, and it will also lead to enhanced eurosclerosis. It was a word which has been coined, I, mean, I think, in the 70s or in the 80s, uh, by a Swedish economist, uh, Asse Lindbeck. Uh, he first talked about sclerosis of our economic systems, and then the Europeans applied it to Europe because they thought that this qualification would fit their situation very well. So enhance eurosclerosis because of extra burdens on the economy. And de facto farewell to the Lisbon strategy. Now, I suppose that nobody in this room knows what the Lisbon strategy is. It was a strategy which was announced about 10 years ago by the leaders of governments in the European Union. And they actually said, well, within 10 years, the European economy will be the best performing, most competitive, uh, and all kinds of nice things were attached to this utopian European uh, economy within 10 years. So now, and in fact, if you would have read uh, between the lines, you would have seen that it was a challenge to the American, to the Anglo-Saxon model, and that Europe actually was inventing or starting what could be called capitalism with a human face, as opposed to the American kind of capitalism, was not very human. Now, of course, nobody knows about it anymore, uh, as with many uh, ideas, many uh, plans of the European Union, but nevertheless, at that time, it was a very popular uh, notion. And then, of course, the European competitors will be jeopardized. It has been said also before uh, in connection with the situation of the United States, if the United States would uh, pursue uh, an active climate policy. We could expect tensions or wars, trade tension, trade wars with non-compliant trade partners. And there are already warnings. For instance, uh, President Sarkozy has said, well, if other countries are not cooperating, are not joining the scheme, then we have to uh, strike back with uh, certain trade sanctions. And the benefit of all these efforts would be 0, 0.0 uh, degree Celsius. 0, 0.0, well, actually 0, 0.02 degrees Celsius, less in 2050, but, well, that was actually the outcome of the calculations of the global warmers, not of the climate skeptics. Now, if, according to the climate skeptics, the outcome would be nihil, n zero. Now, scenario two is worldwide Kyoto participations. All countries will join Kyoto Mark II, so Copenhagen would have been a success. And in the beginning, the cost will be relatively low because it concerns the collection of low-hanging fruit. But then, of course, the screws have to be tightened in every successive phase, and the cost will rise exponentially. 
Ultimately, all 193 countries in the world will have to join. And it should be borne in mind that all those requirements for those countries, all the allocations, would have to be accommodated within a shrinking total of available emission allowances. And of course, uh, equality policy dictates that worldwide distribution of CO2 emission rights will be uh, realized on the basis of equal rights per capita. Because such an allocation would be in conformity with the UN philosophy, equality, egalitarian philosophy. It has been referred before in other sessions that this, of course, would constitute a scheme which is uh, completely uh, uh, dominated by central control on a worldwide level. So, <clears throat> and that, of course, would have been unprecedented in the history of mankind. Now, the question is whether it is uh, uh, likely that 193 countries will be able to reach agreement on such a scheme, and of course the answer is no. Now, what is the alternative? The alternative is that we have to impose such a scheme on them. And then you have to need a body which controls this process. It can be a group of countries, a caucus of countries. It can be an autonomous bureaucratic institution. And uh, yeah, this institution has to propose package deals and these package deals will have to be rubber stamped because you can't tolerate people to open up these packages because then the packages will fall apart. So it will have to be imposed on countries. And directorates, worldwide directorates, you can imagine um, uh, this uh, whole uh, scheme will, of course, require a tremendous concentration of power in the hands of only a few. Now, compliance should be very strict because, uh, yes, if not, then the whole thing falls apart. Now, we have such schemes. We have presidents want a stability pact. Now, everybody can read in the papers what has happened with Greece. The stability pact in Europe, which forbids the European Union to exceed 3% of GDP as a deficit, is not working. So, uh, what to do then? Then, uh, well, people said, for instance, Sir David King, the threat of global warming is more serious to the world than that of terrorism. He said it when he wa was visiting the United States uh, on the day of the commemoration of 9-11. And I can assure you that his audience was not amused. Neither was his government, and uh, so he had to keep his mouth shut in the future. And Sir John, uh, John Horton, he also said, well, uh, we have to compare uh, this uh, threat with a weapon, weapon of mass destruction. We have to save planet Earth. So very strict measures are uh, uh, called for, zero tolerance. But these views are not shared by majority of countries in the world. I already referred to China, I already referred to India, all G77 countries don't want to join the scheme. They see it as a kind of new uh, colonialism now based on climatic arguments. Though they don't want to join it. They have announced it before, for many years already. Nevertheless, the West thought that they could convince other countries to join the scheme. But in Copenhagen, it became clear that uh, this was not possible. Now, the next step will be in Cancun. Now, the situation, the basic situation has not been altered. So my prediction is that Cancun will uh, deliver uh, a same failure as uh, we had in Copenhagen. And as a climate skeptic, I'm very happy that this will be the case. Well, thank you very much.